Good evening and welcome to episode 313 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamanto Mwakumalo. It's a pre-recorded interview this evening, so if you're joining us live, do keep the conversation going down here below, and I'll let you know more about that in a bit. Welcome, of course, to all our new viewers who are joining us for the first time this evening. You're tuned in to the early daily property podcast in South Africa. Do make sure that you also go to our Facebook and our YouTube page to catch up on all the great content that we've already brought to your screens. And to all our regular viewers from the Top Fan Gang members are on Facebook. And of course, those of you who watch us on YouTube and Instagram, welcome to it. You know how we do every single weekday. You and I have an appointment at 7 p.m. where we tackle a hot property topic. And I always am always in conversation with an expert guest who helps us better navigate our property decisions. And of course, talking about helping us manage our property decisions you can of course catch other great shows that we have across private properties social media pages every single weekday at 8 p.m as it is a thursday uh, you can catch a warden in farmer later on this evening at 8 p.m taking you through the farming podcast and of course Mbali is always in conversation with great uh, professionals within the farming and agricultural space and really do help in better getting a better understanding on agricultural matters so it doesn't matter whether you're looking at sort of large-scale commercial farming or starting a smaller operation perhaps as a cooperative uh, farm in a smaller operation that will service your community. That show is certainly one that you do not want to miss out on. And every Mondays and Fridays, Chad takes us through the Home Shoppers Show. They always profiles incredible properties that you can find on www.privateproperty.co.za. So if you're in the market for a property or want to just see a really great properties and what they have on offer, that is a show that you do not want to miss out on. And on Wednesdays, we don't leave you alone. SD Carson brings the first time home buyers show, which is always in conversation with people who've not only walked that first time home buying journey, but have gone on to grow their property portfolios from strength to strength. Those are the great shows that you can look forward to every single weekday at 8 p.m. So do make sure that you set your alarms and, of course, tune in and engage with the team members. Uh, and you'll see that there, you know, where a lot of the, the, the women I mean, um, presenters are also being profiled on our social media pages, so you'll get to know a little bit more about us. You get to see us on your screen so regularly, but there's still a few things that you don't quite know about us. I saw Mbali Nogo's uh, profile coming up yesterday. I was you know, thoroughly uh, surprised at some of the things that I also got to learn about her. Do make sure that you go to the Facebook and Twitter pages to find out all about uh, the different women uh, that you can see on your screens. Well, this evening we're talking about something that I, uh, you know, know a number of people are currently facing right now and probably don't quite understand the the responsibility that lies ahead for them uh, if they're going to walk down this path. We know that many people have been affected by the economic effects of COVID-19. And that has also meant that we're seeing homeowners who are selling their properties, whether because they are looking to you know, downscale the way that they're living or are looking to upgrade and you know, take advantage of the historically low interest rates. But either way, these homeowners are first time sellers. And so they've only really experience the buying side and are fairly clued up about what happens on the buying side, what they need to budget for as uh, you know, prospective home buyers. And yet when it comes to the sell side, unfortunately, not many of us are very aware of not only the process, but what we need to be prepared to 
pay uh, when it comes to the selling side. So this evening, Ezra Murray, who's a partner at Murray Procedure Attorneys, is going to help us better get a, uh, get a better understanding of the financial misconceptions of the first time um, seller. Uh, Ezra, good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, Zama. It's nice to be here. It's always such a pleasure to have you on the show, Isri. You know, Isri, I think th this topic, when I think about it, I, I, I know of a number of first-time sellers and so many of them did not understand or even have an idea that they, there are certain things that they're going to financially uh, have to budget for. You know, some of them thought, look, I already know I'm going to sell my, my property. Let's say even if it's just, you know, 2,000 rands more than what I paid for it. So I know I won't even owe the bank any amount of money. And they thought I'm going to walk away from this transaction without spending anything uh, when it comes to disposing of my property. But you and I know it doesn't quite work like no. that. Um, I think let's, let's just look at how should a prospective seller best financially prepare um, themselves when it comes to you know, the financial um, burden, so to speak, or the financial responsibility that they're going to have to deal with um, when they sell their property? Yes, Zama, thank you for this opportunity because it's something that I've been struggling with um, for quite some time with numerous sellers that I'm dealing with. And it seems like um, when a seller wants to sell their property, they seem to think that everything that they are going to make out of the proceeds of their sale, they can utilize to buy their new property, which is in some instances correct because um, your proceeds can be allocated to, to wherever you're buying. However, there are certain payments that need to take place in the interim before transfer takes place. And I think that's where the misconception or the financial misconception comes into play. Um, so payments like paying for a state agent commission, that can take place at the end of the transfer. Paying for transfer fees of the attorneys, that can take place at the end of the transfer. Some attorneys choose not to do that at that time, but um, you, know, you, you are able to do that. It's not something that's supposed to hold up the transfer. But then there are things like compliance certificates that you pay for now already. Mm. However, you can, you can um, make an arrangement that the conveyancer may deduct at the end of the, the transfer registration point. You can deduct those amounts that, that's necessary for compliance certificates to be paid. So if there were repairs, gas repairs, water repairs, electricity repairs, those kind of things, you can make an arrangement with the companies attending to these compliance certificates and you can arrange with the conveyancer to pay on transfer. But payments that need to be made before transfer that may hold up your transfer if you do not have those funds is specifically SARS, your transfer duty, but that's not for the seller to pay, that's for the purchaser to pay. And for the seller is the rights payment so your um you know generally the the payment will be much lower than um than anticipated however the municipalities charge you an amount of um 60 to 90 days in advance so whenever we get those rights figures and we present them to the sellers we say to them you are your rights figures for payment ultimately what they think in their minds is that I'm not in arrears with my municipality payment. Why is this amount so high? And then what we need to explain to them is that you have to pay for 90, 60 to 90 days in advance because what the municipality does is they effectively want to make sure that they receive payment for the municipal rates up until transfer. So mm -hmm. they're not out of pocket. What you could do and what they do, and they're generally quite good with that, is that if if you pay 90 days in advance and your registration takes place within, say, 60 days of, of um, your advance payment, the municipality will pro rata refund the seller um, into their bank account that we've provided them with, with the, the amount that they've overpaid for that amount of municipality and rates. So generally, that amount is the amount that they need to understand is payable in advance. 
But I, I earlier said that transfer duty is also a payment that may hold up um, your transfer if you don't have the funds to pay. So generally what happens is that a seller is going to buy at, at another place and that's why they're selling. So they're also a purchaser on the other side. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where I also see that they, they don't understand that they think the proceeds of the sale can be utilized to pay for their transfer duty where they're purchasing. And the problem is that if these two transfers are taking place simultaneously, you do not have the funds now to pay for the transfer duty and receive the receipt from SARS until registration. So those, even though it's not a seller payment to make, you might be a purchaser on the other transfer where you have to pay transfer duty and you think that you can utilize your proceeds, but you can't because your proceeds are still locked in. Because we have to remember, we can go back to your purchaser where you are selling and ask them if we can use some of the deposit that they paid to, to, to pay for our transfer duty where we buy. But if we want to do that, your, your purchaser is losing interest on the funds that they would have received for the money lying in my trust account. So it's all very difficult to explain to clients that, you know, we can, we can make these things happen, but somewhere someone is going to lose money or interest if we're going to take from Peter to pay to Paul in order to make the second transfer work. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know as you've actually highlighted a few key things that, that I want us to, to chew on a bit, um, because as, as you've pointed out, there's so many different kinds of scenarios. And in all of them, it's the seller not being aware of the financial obligation that they're going to have. Um, when they need to, or rather when they sell their property. I want to find out from the viewers at home if you've encountered this, especially, of course, as a first-time uh, seller. We talk a lot about first-time buying, some of the surprise costs that many of us unfortunately didn't know about. Uh, many of you at home know about my, you know, my, my faux pas when it came to not knowing that I had to pay two attorneys per uh, finance property when I was buying my first properties. And because I was buying two simultaneously, I had to pay four, four attorneys and, you know, lo and behold, I'd only budgeted for two. And by the time the third and the fourth um, invoice came about, I obviously got the shock of my life. So I'm, I'm very aware of, you know, the of not having a, a clear picture uh, in as far as finances that you need to get in order as a buyer. But as, as you know, Ezra has also pointed out, is sellers uh, and first-time sellers tend to also not have a, a, a good understanding of some of their obligations when they sell. And it could easily hold up the process. I mean, we already know that right now, uh, you know, properties are taking quite a long time to lodge and eventually transfer at the deeds office because of COVID. And you wouldn't want your property transfer to be delayed uh, by something that you have control over. I think there's already so many other factors that as, as a seller, you don't have control over. Uh, by virtue of putting your property on the market, you are obviously want it to sell. So you don't want to be the reason why there is a delay um, in your property being sold, especially at that stage where you found the right buyer, they qualify, they've put down a deposit. Um, that stage already is, you know, takes so much time uh, that by the time you're in that sort of uh, stage in the transaction, you do not want to be the reason why uh, you know, that offer sort of falls through or uh, it doesn't get registered. Now, Isri, I want us to talk a, a bit more about the, the rates and now even the levies, right? Because you're talking about how the oftentimes, you know, municipalities will give you either 60 or 90 days that you must pay in advance. We're seeing the same thing, obviously, with levies for people who live in sectional entitled communities and some also have the same you know, sentiment of, well, I keep paying my levies every month. And when there has to be a levy clearance, then there's, there's, you know, there's an issue. And, and the, the reality, unfortunately, is there are people who live in uh, complexes or estates where both the rates and the levies are relatively high, so higher than sort of the average. And so the upfront costs can be, can be quite substantial, especially if you um, haven't budgeted for it can you just take us through the, the levy component of it? Because I know this is another one that a lot of sellers uh, tend to not be aware they need to adequately budget for. 
Yes. So with regards to the levies, it's quite interesting. Um, most of the times I've found in the past, um, we now deal with levies and homeowners associations. So you've got body corporates and a homeowners association. So there are actually, in fact, two payments to be made. Um, the, the, the payment that's allocated to the purchaser in that regard with regards to a transfer is payment for the consent. So we have to, in terms of your title deed, you have to um, apply to the homeowners association to, to provide consent from their side that they are happy for the transfer to take place. This consent is usually payable by the um, by the purchaser, and it's usually in the amount of about 500 rand or 650 rand. The the higher amount payable is for the seller's account, and that is your 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 levies up to date. And in some instances, your homeowners association levy is also up to date. So you make two payments, and some homeowners uh, insist that you make the payment for an annual fee. So I've had a, in, in the recent past, I've had a seller had to pay 28,000 Rand in order to get a homeowners association clearance up to the end of November. But the transfer will take place um, way sooner. So you have to pay that, but then you have to arrange for a refund to be paid to them on transfer. I understand that they, they might become anxious because in order to get that refund allocated to you within the next month or so just after transfer is also another problem because they might be out of pocket for two to three months where they could have utilized that to pay for their next levy on the next property that they're purchasing. But yes, so with regards to homeowners associations and body corporates, those are the two amounts that they're looking to have to pay um, sometimes it's only two months in advance or, or three months in advance, but in most instances, the homeowners association will be an annual fee in advance. So it's quite a large amount. But then otherwise, it might be um, a levy just up to date, up to transfer date. If you can calculate the transfer date and you then only pay up to that date. But then you also have to remember the other problem is that we request these uh, consents from the homeowners and from the body corporates, but that they're only valid most of the time for 30 days. Mm. So the way that we've been operating in the deeds office and with the municipality being late, et cetera, it's been a very difficult task to know how far in advance I need to prepare to pay for this consent um, because they expiring month after month after month because we're not able to lodge in the deeds offices or to have the matter registered timelessly. Mm -hmm. And you know, Ezra, I actually recently encountered just that where, uh, where you know, um, clearance figures had expired, so payment was made, they'd expired, we had to get new dates in uh, and sort of new timeframes in, make another payment. Uh, and, and luckily when everything got, got resolved, payments were made, um, by the time the matter came up for purpose, the deeds office, it so happened that on the day of registration, the deeds office was was closed because of, you know, there was a COVID case, so they had to decontaminate uh, and it ended up only registering the following day. And, and I think I was quite fortunate in that it... The, the, there weren't as many delays by the time the matter was ready to actually be lodged. So a lot of the, the, the you know, pressure points were actually prior to that stage. And by the time the matter was ready to lodge, everything pretty much went smoothly, you know, except of course that one day when the deeds office was closed. But of course, all those delays could, you know, very easily sometimes even um, lead to a person who had bond guarantees and maybe potentially um, the bank no longer being able to extend uh, the guarantees for, you know, a longer period, because we also know that those also have their own time frame. Have you found any instances, especially now during COVID, because one of the things that I, I saw is, we were outside of the sort of normal time frame, and as far as some of the guarantees were concerned, and but luckily, really, I want to say that the bank was understanding um, in terms of you know we're in COVID, there have been certain delays when it comes to certain things, and so there wasn't really pressure on the other side that um, the, you know the party is going to uh, lose their their bond. But is that a possibility? Because I think sometimes sellers 
don't quite get the magnitude of the delays. I mean, buyers know it uh, because they have a, an estate agent sitting on them and an attorney sitting on them and explaining all these different timeframes. And so they're very aware that if I don't pay this you know, on time, I might lose out. And if you lose out too late in the game, then you're also liable for all kinds of payments. But the sellers don't, don't get that kind of pressure, right? We don't pressure sellers in terms of these payments need to be made uh, you know, quickly because these are the p- potential repercussions. Do you get instances where uh, you know, there's, a, there's a delay from the seller side and, and that delay really is due to uh, finances that has even led to a deal ultimately falling through? Yes, um, I, I think in most cases that would be in developments. So I've, I've got a few developments where we are sitting with some, uh, some purchases that have to apply for bonds. Um, and due to the fact that the seller or the developer's um, documents aren't in order or they haven't received the required certificates that they need or, you know, for whatever reason, the bank then comes back and says, but we can't, we can't provide your purchaser with, with bond approval anymore. You know, the problem we sit with in COVID specifically um, also is that we are um, extending these applications to the bank that the purchasers applied for, and they might have had their job up to August, but then they lost their job or they're working for themselves and they don't earn a better income or they don't earn any income anymore. And then you sit with a situation where the bank turns around and says, well, you know, sorry, but time has lapsed and we have to revisit your bond approval and see whether you now actually do, it could be considered or can't. So um, we've had instances like that where the purchaser had to go back to the bank and say, please, I need pre-approval again. And they have refused. And that's a very sad situation, but unfortunately, it's also part of the bigger picture, which is not just, um, you know, the seller that didn't pay on time. Um, it's unfortunately all just one big bag of problems at this point of time in time with regards to, to the issues we, we're having with COVID too. Mm. And, and, you know, as I think when you even highlight that, that never mind a deal potentially falling through because of COVID and banks even being extra cautious when it comes to, you know, granting home loans and in the event where there are delays, as, as you're highlighting, they go and have the matter revisited to see if the person still qualifies. And one of the things I've found is unfortunately, and we've seen this pre-COVID, I think it's, it's more pronounced right now, where from the buy side, you know, people sometimes weren't particularly aware of some of the costs and when they, you know, sort of get pre-approved and as they find out what they need to be paying for, if so, if you're like me and you end up finding, oh, actually, it's not just the transferring attorneys you must pay, there's also a bond registration attorney that you need to pay uh, and, and you need to make that payment. Uh, in the event where you find you know, out something like that as, as a buyer, you tend to find that because they feel there are so many uh, steps into the transaction, they then go and take out, you know, a personal loan or extend another credit facility that, of course, impacts their affordability in, in their home loan. And we often say to buyers, do not do that. Don't try. Don't take a new line of credit uh, when you're getting ready to buy a, a home. You don't want to, you know, jeopardize your chances of either getting the home loan, getting it at the, you know, loan to value that you want, and also getting it at the interest rate that you want. So the, the repercussions are quite a lot. And, and I, I'm sure then Isri, there've certainly been instances where because of the delays, we're also then finding that some of the buyers uh, had gone on and taken other lines of credit because it's just been so long, right? And mm-hmm. that in the interim, even though their job is still the same, their income is still the same, because the nature of their um, you know, credit for, um, obligations have changed, the, the amount that the bank is also comfortable sort of lending, you know, can change. So previously, the bank was very happy to grant you that 600K, um, you know, home loan, they're going to pay for everything. But you went and took, or, you know, took a, a personal loan or extended a credit card. And now they're thinking, actually, 
maybe we can only, you know, do a 550. And of course, 50,000 Rand isn't just going to, you know, appear out of, out of nowhere. Nobody, uh, a majority of us don't have that kind of money just lying around. Um, you know, have you seen those instances? Because I think we're not realizing the effects of delays on, on the transaction in its entirety, right? It, on the one hand, we can say the buyers get affected in this way. On the other hand, sellers can be the reason or they can get affected in this way. But from a holistic perspective, there's so many things that can happen um, due to the delays. Yes, I think you know, the one other aspect that the sellers don't take into account is they usually have a bond to be cancelled. And if you cancel your bond in advance, before the time that you're actually supposed to pay it off, then you pay a penalty fee. Mm -hmm. And in most instances, I think that sellers aren't aware of this. And the moment that they try to cancel the bond, that's when the bank comes back to them and says, well, you in for a penalty fee. And it's usually quite a big amount. Mm -hmm. um, and that they, they, they haven't prepared for that either. So they think I'm selling my house for 100,000 rand. My bond is 80,000 rand. So I'll have enough left at the end of the day. I've got 20 left. But no, in fact, you have to deduct those amounts. You have to deduct all the other, like the conveyancing fees, all the other fees you need to pay for. And that I find that they're usually not aware of. But also, if you're going to, if, if your purchaser pays um, cash, they can obviously either pay cash or they can pay with a bond. So when they also apply for a bond, we need to issue guarantees from their bond attorneys that are giving us the funds to settle that bond cancellation of the seller. And when we do that, generally your seller is also purchasing and also with a bond, and we need to also pay off the second transfer's bond. So all these things happen simultaneously, and I think what both sellers and purchasers don't understand is if these matters are financially linked, you actually can't do much but wait, and you'll have to have a lot of funds or cash available for these extra amounts that you have to pay in order for transfer to take place. So this morning, a good example, I've got three transfers running together. And the first one in the, in the, the first OTP that was signed, they're almost done. Everything is finished in that matter. I'm ready to lodge. But it's reliant on the second transfer and the second transfer is reliant on the third one. And the first one's rights clearance certificate is going to expire soon, but we don't have rights clearance certificates issued for the second and the third one yet. Mm -hmm. So now we're sitting in a situation where the poor first seller is waiting for his money, everything is there, everything's in place, but it's reliant on the second and the third transfers to go through before we get to a point where we can actually pay out. And I think mm -hmm. what these first time sellers don't understand is they think, I've signed my OTP, my house is on the market for 5.2 million, I'm going to get my 5.2 million the moment that I sign my offer to purchase. And that's unfortunately not how it works. And in fact, you're only going to get it on registration. You're also not going to get it when the funds are paid into the trust account or when they've got bond approval. So it's quite a long wait for sellers and I think that's also something that I need to take into account. Mm -hmm. So I think as we, the gist of it is also as a seller, you need to not budget uh, on on the proceeds of you know the sale of your property coming in within a week or within a month because it's it's a fairly long process. So if there's another financial obligation that you have and it could be something else, you know, it doesn't even have to be property. You want to not rely on these funds as much as possible because, as you say, they, they don't get released immediately at all. You know, they after even after the registration, uh, you know, transferring attorneys will reconcile the statement if all these different payments had been made and then you will get a okay this is now what you know is supposed to come to you or actually given all the other payments that had to be made as a seller you actually don't have any proceeds uh you know that yes. come to you it 
pretty much just gets to zero. So being aware of, um, we'll call it the, the balance sheet, the balancing act, the financial balancing act that has to take place when you're selling your property is such an important thing um, as a seller, especially if you're selling because you're in a financially difficult mm-hmm. situation. I think the, the big one is, re- is you know people who are looking to sell for downscaling purposes and aren't aware and I'm so glad that you actually brought up the 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 you know the bond cancellation and how you can get you know penalized by your bank. I know there's certain banks that have waived that amount and um, I mean the penalty during this period. Others are still going to penalize if you don't give them sufficient notice. And 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 it's such an important thing to bear in mind because if you're down Grading because you're in a financially difficult situation or perhaps you're looking at I'm going to sell so I can rent for a little bit and suppose for example you had taken the payment holidays um, that the banks offered last year and so your interest essentially kept piling on so you had the payment holiday for you could have taken it for three months or an extended period of six months but because the interest kept you know sort of piling on you don't realize by the time that you now want to sell how much that effectively cost you. So it really is important that you get a really good grasp of your finances as a seller, uh, especially if you are relying on getting money from you know, your bond facility when you, or rather when you sell uh, that particular property, because you may just find that it's less than what you anticipated, if at all, or you may find that you have to make additional payments because you went and took you know, payment holidays, it was still the relatively early stages of your home loan, so you hadn't uh, chipped away um, in terms of the payment, maybe you also hadn't put down a deposit, so all these different factors um, certainly do come to play. The one cost, Esri, that I know sometimes, and and you mentioned it earlier on, is, of course, the bond cancellation of attorneys as well. Uh, I mean, you had mentioned how sellers can sometimes uh, sort of work around it with some some bond registration, uh, bond cancellation attorneys, rather, um, you know, taking their money from the proceeds later on. But we're also finding that where they can see that this isn't one of those instances where there'll be a lot of funds sort of left behind, they may just say they actually want their payment up front. Um, and so you need to pay in into the trust account. And, and that's a cost that I know so many people, especially a first time seller, you just wouldn't know. I mean, the mere fact that we learn when we're buying a property that there's a bond registration attorney, uh, you probably don't forget about it. And don't yeah. think there's also going to be a bond cancellation attorney. Yes, I think, you know, the biggest surprise to me is sometimes people or sellers specifically think that if their bond is paid up and it's zero, then the bond is done and it's cancelled and they've got nothing to do with it anymore. But it's not physically cancelled in the deeds office. And so exactly in this matter that I'm busy with at the moment, it's the same thing. This woman thought that her bond was cancelled, everything was done, she's not paying it off anymore, there's nothing to be done, but there's a cancellation fee to the attorney's payable, which I can completely understand comes out of the blue and you do not accept it and you, you don't like it, but it is what it is. So that's that's the one. The other thing, the other um, expense, but that's for the purchaser, but also, you know, it also, it, it, it might fall um, before a seller that's purchasing another property, if you pay your bond, uh, your bond attorneys, those fees are much higher than the bond cancellation fees. And in fact, that it's on a scale and the scale is almost exactly the same amount that you pay for the transfer fees. So you're in for basically double transfer fees if you pay for your bond attorneys and you pay for the transfer attorneys and you pay for a bond cancellation for where you're selling. So there are a lot of costs. And I must say, from my side, what I'd like to get across to the to the listeners is just to say that perhaps it's a good idea that when you sign your OTP, that either your agent or the attorney that you're appointing, they can work out. We, I mean, it's not it's not exact science at that point in time. But we can basically provide you with a with a reconciliation account of what you might be in for. Because, you know, bore the fact that there might be problems with your plumbing at home and you have a lot of repairs to be done or um, electricity issues, etc., 
We know your bond cancellation will basically be in the region of 4,500 rand. We know that your compliance certificates, if there's nothing wrong, is 750 rand each. So those kind of expenses we can give you upfront so that you know um, what you might be in for. Your bond cancellation figure takes a bit of time to get from the bank and to get from those attorneys but at least we know what you're in for with regards to the cost of the bond cancellation fees. Um, then, you know, we, so that would be my suggestion to your sellers is to say to them, we can provide you with some sort of a reconciliation up front that you, that you better and well equipped in order to, to navigate this process going forward. Mm -mm -mm. And I think that's a, a great place to leave it at, um, Isri, that really you want to, um, have a good sense as a seller of what you're up for at the beginning and you're able to ask your, your transferring attorney for a, a, a good roadmap and a financial roadmap of what lies ahead so you can best prepare. And, and I think if anything, if you're going to be looking at selling right now, just based on this episode alone, you already have a sense that there are things that you need to be budgeting for, um, especially if, for example, you might be in arrears with rates or your levies, uh, it's not going to sell without those being paid off. And this, of course, you're going to uh, you know, want your property to go on auction, which is a completely different uh, ball game altogether. But if you're sort of doing the conventional sale, those are figures that you're going to have to make sure are uh, you know, adequately paid for and cleared um, so that by the time you get a buyer, the process is as smooth as possible. So make sure you plan. We talk about you know, buyers being able to budget and adequately plan for the buying process. As a seller, get your ducks in a row, you know, from your financial ducks in a row um, to all the paperwork that you're going to need. Selling also has its own set of paperwork um, that you need to, you know, to get ready contact your bank and just give notice. So even if you end up you know, not selling, just give notice. I think one of the nice things, it's, it's logged on the system, doesn't negatively affect you in any way. Um, and they'll send you an email saying that, you know, this notice was put into this bond facility. I think it expires after 90 days um, or it's valid for, you know, that period. And in the event where you end up not selling, it's fine. But rather do that the moment you think of, of selling before the ad even goes up. Just do that already preemptively. I think that would be my big tip from, you know, from an admin perspective, uh, in addition to what Isri has shared with us this evening. Well, Isri, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us it's always great uh, to speak to you thank you very much it was a wonderful experience and good luck to all those sellers out there <laughs> Absolutely. And that is Ezra Murray, who's a partner at Murray Pusiti Attorneys, wrapping up the Thursday edition of the Private Property Podcast with myself, Uzaman Dungwa Kumalo. I know we're pre-recorded, but we're going to keep the conversation going on our social media pages. So do comment down here below for the sellers. You know, did you have any financial surprises when you were selling your property that you were not aware of prior to walking down that selling journey? Do share with us down here below. Well, that's a wrap from me. I'll be back on your screens tomorrow evening. I'll be live tomorrow at 7 p.m. Until then, hoping you're staying home and staying safe.